I became a physician because um, well, I always liked science when I was in school and um, as I got a little older and I did like science and I thought research would be interesting and fun but then I found I liked working with people and working more directly with people so that's how I sort of ended up deciding I'll go to medical school and incorporate science with directly working with people and so, and I, so I like being a physician because you get to um, work with people, improve their lives and um, you know and you know, hopefully make a positive impact, you know, for these people. So that's what I, that's what I like the most about it. As I kind of studied science and different things, I was always interested in neuroscience. And so at one point going through, I thought, well, I'll do either neurology or psychiatry or, or neurosurgery. And then going through medical school and rotating through each of those specialties, then that's when you get to see the sort of day-to-day -day routine and what type of problems you encounter and that's and so come to that I always from the beginning of my training I like neuroscience I thought that the brain and neuroscience was fascinating um, and then but neurosurgery just sort of fit my personality better than the other two so that's how I sort of end up getting into neurosurgery. In a broad sense um, brain, spine, and peripheral nerve problems. So we do, we treat things like degenerative diseases of the spine, tumors of the spine, uh, mechanical problems um, of the spine, brain in terms of the brain, brain tumors, um, among other structural lesions in the brain. So we, we will see not only degenerative disease of the spine and brain, but also cancers of the spine and the brain and various things like that sometimes. Um, hemorrhages, we'll see hemorrhages, and that could be in the spine or the brain, and you know, so that's probably those are probably the most common things that we that we deal with and see. Yeah. In a private practice, the the bulk of work is going to be in degenerative spine. That's just where the, the majority of the work is. But we see we do a lot of that, and a lot of we do see quite a few brain tumors. But we don't really here. We're kind of general neurosurgeon. We don't really subspecialize. Well, we do, we do see a lot of, um, I mean, people with neck and back pain and headaches, we, we do get referrals for those type of things. Across the board, the majority of neck pain, back pain, and headaches don't really need surgical intervention. But we do end up seeing a lot of that because they'll get imaging and they want us to take a look. So part of the process is um, a screening it. Even if it's not surgical, we can facilitate the non-surgical treatments. And that's what we try to do is take the conservative route. People that are having extremity pain, electrical pain, or numbness or tingling, or difficulty walking, severe headaches, confusion, you know, those kind of neurological symptoms um, would see us. A lot of times they've had imaging already that found a structural lesion. Um, sometimes they have it, and then we can get that imaging if we need to. But if we always say, you know, err with caution. If if they're in doubt, we're happy to see them. A lot of things are not surgical, but that's okay. We we facilitate referral out for the conservative treatments. And if it is surgical, it doesn't automatically mean they will have to have surgery or need surgery imminently. But we, there's always there's usually a treatment you can try before that, and only if symptoms are severe enough. Would they would it progress to something surgical? So most of the things we see don't end up needing surgery, but we we're always happy to screen those things and determine you know what the right pathway for somebody's going to be. Uh, well, my approach is all really now and has always been that um, try to always always put the patient's best interest at heart. Even though, even though we are a surgical practice, and that's our primary focus is surgery treatment, um, if, if I think there's always a gray area in medicine where things aren't really urgent surgery and totally not. So there's a gray area of surgery, but I always think conservative treatment first. What can we, is there anything that we can do so this patient won't need surgery, even though we do need, we, even though we do surgery. Um, I'll always encourage people, let's try something without surgery, and if that's, Possible. So, and I think that's putting the patient's best interest at heart. So I always do what I would do for myself or my family uh, in doing that. And I think if you follow that approach, it's pretty much in line with that, that pledge we have for our patients.
Well, I mean, we've, we've of course, followed all the necessary guidelines during this period of time. Um, it's, it's impacted our practice, so for a period of time, having to postpone elective surgeries. And then, um, like I said earlier, there's always a gray area between emergency and totally, totally elective. Then there's a gray area where someone might have a tremendous amount of pain, but they don't really have a neurologic deficit. So it's not really urgent or emergent. So we were trying to take care of those people and kind of gauge how much discomfort does it warrant doing that. So it was a, the cha a challenge for us was trying to decide who could wait, who couldn't wait, what were the appropriate ones to wait given the guidelines that we had and which ones were. So that, that, that made it a challenge, but I think luckily we've moved to a point now where we can take care of most, well virtually all the patients now again and kind of get back to some similar to normalcy. But, but we've, we've continued to follow the guidelines and we continue to do that even now because we all know that COVID-19 is not over with. And so we have to just be cognizant of, you know, what could, what could come in the future with that.